And next, I'd like to invite up Dr. Susan Carlson. She is the A.J. Rice Professor of Nutrition for the Department of Dietetics and Nutrition at the University of Kansas Medical Center. She will uh, address um, seafood consumption and preterm birth. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I want to start out with a comment before I go into my talk because um, we've just discussed neurocognition, and that's really where I have spent most of my career looking not at seafood but at DHA, one of the nutrients in seafood. And I just want to point out that this conversation on all of the nutrients in seafood really resonates with me because we have just published within the last couple months results of our trial out to age six of children whose mothers were supplemented with DHA during pregnancy. I'm going to talk about some of the good things that have come out of that, but uh, we did not find any benefit for cognition after three years of age in those children, so just with a single nutrient. And, and I think we can't emphasize enough that there's a lot of literature coming out now with concern on iodine intake by U.S. women. John, uh, Joe pointed out how many IQ points the Midwest uh, lost in those intervening years. Uh, and so I think that's, that's just something that, that I want to think about. But, but today, um, I'm going to talk about DHA, the intake gap, and its role in U.S. pregnancies with regard to another outcome that was actually somewhat serendipitous uh, finding of our last clinical trial that began in 2006 and, and what's really emerged around that because we're not the only uh, group that has been working in this space and in fact there's been a very large trial with 5,544 women that just was reported in New England Journal of Medicine last week uh, on this with a trial designed exactly to look at the effect of DHA supplementation on preterm birth. So these are old data from back around 2000. Uh, uh, really, what is the gap uh, on DHA intake in pregnancy? And women, pregnant and lactating women in the US at that time were estimated to be taking about 54 milligrams of DHA. There were recommending bodies, including ISFAL, of mm -hmm. which many of us in this room are members, the International Society for the Study of Fatty Acids and Lipids. Uh, that were recommending about 300 milligrams of DHA per day, and that has actually resulted in a lot of prenatals now that contain about 200 milligrams. It's hard to find a prenatal supplement now that doesn't provide at least a couple hundred milligrams of DHA. So that, that gap uh, may be addressed, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I can tell you, and this is relevant to a seafood uh, conference, that We've looked at uh, about 600, the first 600 women in a clinical trial we're in the middle of now with about, we're planning to enroll 1,250 women. And the first 600, the mean daily DHA intake from diet is 59 milligrams per day. So yes, we're in the Midwest and we have some sites in Ohio. Uh, so it's not, women are not really still eating seafood. Now, one of the things Again, on this message of multiple nutrients in seafood, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association is now advocating for improving nutrition in the first 1,000 days. That includes pregnancy and the first couple years of life uh, for supporting childhood development and adult health. They haven't, they've advocated for long-chain uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, including DHA, but they haven't made recommendations on the amount that women should take, and that's really not their role. But every one of the nutrients here that has an asterisk beside it is one that they identified particularly of interest for the developing neurocognitive, uh, for the neurocognitive development of that first thousand days. And you see there's a lot of asterisks on here, and many of these nutrients are really a you know, seafood is a great source of those nutrients. And maybe this is explaining why we're finding neurocognitive benefit with seafood, but not with DHA alone in pregnancy. So one of the, one of the issues that has really plagued us, I think, is that we have a biochemical pathway to synthesize 
uh, DHA, and, I, and, and our recommendations from the National Academy of Medicine are that we should be consuming a certain amount of alpha linolenic acid, even though we've known for over 30 years that you can feed no amount of alpha linolenic acid that will raise DHA levels in an infant to the same level as an infant that's fed DHA in his mother's, his or her mother's milk. And I think this is, this, this availability of a pathway has, has uh, allowed people to say, well, if we just eat enough of this alpha linolenic acid, we don't need DHA. And this has plagued our field for a long time. We still do not have any recommendations from our recommending bodies nationally that we should have DHA as an essential nutrient. And I hope that this can change at some point. Again, this is my opinion up here, not in the official body. So you can, this, this is a pretty old slide, but it, it really demonstrates that almost all the good sources of dietary DHA are coming from seafood. Uh, most Americans get most of their DHA from eggs. That, that is the most common source of DHA in the U.S. diet as a whole. And, and I know this is an educated group of people who understand seafood, and many of you live on the coast, and seafood is readily available, but this is the reality, is that most people are not getting their DHA from seafood. And one of the issues that's still plaguing us, and the... And the the, the studies show this now, several studies have shown this, that women are just very concerned about seafood. They don't really understand which seafood has mercury, and we've had advisories on mercury, and that do no harm is in their mind. They, they are very concerned. They don't really feel comfortable with seafood. And as Joe has just shown us, the, the evidence that the, even the mercury in some of these sources of fish is really not probably of the concern that we have made it, partly because most of these fish are not even available commercially that, that are worn. So we've made, we've made this recommendation to be very careful about seafood, and that's what sticks in pregnant women's minds. So uh, I'm here to talk about preterm birth and uh, I just want to start out with a little bit of history because we've known for over 20 years, but we didn't really know it. But the data has been there that you can reduce birth before 34 weeks by giving enough fish oil, uh, fish oil as a source of DHA and EPA to pregnant women. And we know that from Sure Olson's work uh, in Denmark or way back when. Uh, but I think one of the reasons we kind of disregarded this work was because these studies were done with women who were very high risk for delivering preterm. And yes, you can see it reduced early preterm birth from 19% to 9.4 in one study, a very small study, from 14.9 to 10.6 in Sher Olson's much larger study. But again, you know, what, is, what does this mean? Uh, most women are not expected to have a preterm birth. And it was really the trials that Maria Macritas did, a very large trial uh, in Adelaide, Australia, and in our trial, much smaller in Kansas City, where we asked as a secondary question, does it have an effect on preterm birth, not really thinking we'd find anything. And of course, in both studies, we found a very significant reduction in birth before 34 weeks. In our study, with about 150 women per group, it was pretty dramatic. I mean, it was probably overdramatic as we, we suspect now, but uh, that really, because these were secondary questions, they were not the primary question of the trial, and in, in the rules of randomized controlled trials, you then have to do a study where this is your primary outcome, and they have just reported theirs in New England Journal of Medicine last week, as I said, with 5,544 women, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Our trial is still recruiting. I think we have 950 women uh, as I left Kansas City, and we're going for 1,250. But in the U.S., we have a higher rate of early preterm birth than they do in Australia, so we had to have a, a we could have a smaller cohort. So, uh, so what we found. Uh, I just showed you the reduction in early preterm birth. But 
Here's why people really care about birth before 34 weeks, because of all the preterm babies, remember preterm baby is anybody born before 37 weeks gestation, but of all the preterm babies, and these, these were looking at how many days babies spent in the hospital after birth if they were born less than 37 weeks. If they were in the placebo group compared to the group that was mothers were randomized to 600 milligrams of DHA. And you can see that it's a little over a month longer that they spend in the hospital. And it's a little more expensive. Uh, we looked at the, the uh, diagnosis related, uh, the, the DRGs, uh, the diagnosis related groups of every single baby born in our hospital. So yes, a baby that's born very early is gonna cost more than $1,652. But on average, if you were born in our hospital and we looked at the cost using DRGs for every one of those deliveries and it averaged out to be $1,652, which when you multiply it uh, across the approximately 4 million births that occur in the US each year, we estimated could be a savings of up to $6 billion, even with universal supplementation at 600 milligrams per day. So uh, there's a paper that came out about a month ago, uh, at least it came to my attention a month ago, and, and the title of the paper was something to the effect of why did it take us so long to figure out that omega-3 fatty acids could reduce preterm birth? And they looked at 184 countries, and I, I put this up here because it's, it's got a very convenient number. Uh, they calculated that there would be benefits. This, this is looking at women's omega-3 LC PUFA intake in relation to preterm birth in that country. And they, they calculated there was benefit up to 600 milligrams of, of omega-3s per day, which in a diet would is not be coming from supplements. This is coming from fish eating, most likely, seafood eating. And in our trial in Kansas City, we did some secondary analysis because we gave women three capsules per day. Each capsule contained 200 milligrams. So if they took every capsule per week, that would be 21 capsules a week or 600 milligrams uh, per day. Uh, and we found this consistent... Uh, reduction over that progression because of course not all women take all of their supplements so we have a lot of people at zero that that weren't were given the placebo and then uh, of the women who were given the supplements they took a varying number of capsules we we do capsule counts and we have an investigational pharmacy that does all of this for us so 600 milligrams per day uh, seems to be reasonable for DHA now, in the meantime, uh, in November last year, uh, Maria Macritis's group, uh, while they were still uh, waiting for the results of their trial to come out, uh, looked, they did a systematic review, um, a Cochrane analysis. It's made a big splash. They looked at 70 randomized controls trials with about 20,000 women, and they compared omega-3 interventions, including supplements or food, with placebo, but these were all randomized control trials. And what they concluded from that study was that uh, there was about an 11% reduction in births less than 37 weeks. Remember I said that's the official designation for preterm birth. High quality evidence for an 11% reduction, but births less than 34 weeks with only nine RCTs, of which R2 provided quite a bit, and the four that I showed you a, little, a few minutes ago provided most of those, high quality evidence for a 42% reduction in birth before 34 weeks. They also found high quality evidence for reduction in low birth weight, birth less than 2,500 grams, uh, uh, moderate quality evidence for a 25% 25 25 reduction in perinatal deaths, and a moderate quality evidence for an 8% reduction in NICU admissions. And I think the reason on the NICU admissions is it doesn't seem to get these babies all the way to term. It gets them to that 34 to 37 week window where they have to go to the NICU, but they get to go home pretty soon afterward. So this is the trial that came out. I mentioned uh, Macrita's trial. It's called the ORIP trial. They gave 800 milligrams of DHA and 100 milligrams of EPA. It was a fish, it was a seafood source. Um, 
it's I, I'm hesitant to get too much into this trial because it was just just came out and it's one of those trials where you publish the intention to treat. If you look into it, the intention to treat basically is not showing any benefit of, of DHA supplementation. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more analysis of that. Uh, Bill Harris and I were looking yesterday at the um, supplementary material and if you look at it, you can see that women who are below uh, in the in the lower two quartiles of DHA status when they enrolled in the trial, those women do have a benefit of the DHA supplementation. But the upper two quartiles, women who had a higher DHA, didn't appear to. And I think there's going to be a lot of secondary analysis out of this trial. Um, I don't think in any way it overcomes the conclusion that DHA is important to prevent preterm birth. But uh, it's, like I said, it's uh, going to be added into all of that. Now, our trial is still recruiting. Um, we're comparing 200 versus 1,000. It's not a placebo-controlled trial. It's a trial to determine whether 1,000 is better than what the current dose in most prenatals is. And one of the reasons we did that is we could not get people to enroll in a trial if we don't allow them to have at least 200 milligrams of DHA. So in the end, we'll have, we'll have data that's historical as well as data from this RCT. Now, one of the things I, I want to point out that, and, and this is my next to the last slide, is it's, that we need to understand is, is DHA is a nutrient, and there's been a lot of consciousness raised around this. Uh, unfortunately, it's not been raised from the perspective of let's eat more seafood in pregnancy, but it's definitely been raised in the, in the cognition, eye health, a lot of other uh, things around this nutrient. And what we have seen when, in our kudos and hope trials, which were both conducted in Kansas City in 2006, the mean red blood cell DHA level was 4.3% in both of those studies at baseline. In our ADORE trial, which is the one that's ongoing now, we began in 2016, the mean is now up to 6.1% red blood cell DHA. It's a little higher than you've been shown here. And we have another NIH trial going on in Kansas City that's conducted by Kathleen Gustafson. It's also DHA supplementation during pregnancy. Also, hers is 200 compared to 800. Um, it's the PANDA trial, and you can see they're even higher than the ADORE trial. Why is that? Well, the PANDA trial seems to be enrolling more highly educated moms, more moms who, because she does a lot of sophisticated studies of the autonomic nervous system in her baby. She's not just trying to get them to take the DHA for uh, reducing early preterm birth. Uh, the ECHO and NAPS trials, uh, those started in 2016 in inner city women in Chicago, uh, all African American, and you can see they look very much, we're, we're the analytical core for all of these trials, by the way. Uh, you can see that those numbers are very similar to what we found in 2006. So we have right now a disparity in DHA status among pregnant women. Uh, unfortunately, among African American women, as you probably all know, that they have the highest rate of early preterm birth. And so it's really becoming our mission to try to figure out how to work with that community to improve their DHA status um, and improve their rates of early preterm birth. So just to summarize, um, very low DHA intakes are associated with an increased risk of the most costly and devastating early births, those that occur before 34 weeks gestation. The 2000 Cochrane Review demonstrates strong evidence for increasing DHA intake to reduce preterm birth with most benefit for births before 34 weeks gestation. Um, and I think that one of the things they say in that analysis is we don't need to do any more studies. Unfortunately, they and we were in the middle of studies uh, when we couldn't really stop. So we'll have some more data to add to that, but it's not going to change the conclusion. The author suggests a need for greater than 500 milligrams per day. That's not in the Cochrane Review. It's in the, the report to pediatricians and obstetricians that Maria Macritas and her group wrote afterward. Uh, and they based that on the fact that most of the trials actually gave DHA and in pretty high doses, the, most of the trials that worked. And as I said before, well, one of the things that I didn't mention was that 
uh, Maria has reported the results of their uh, ORIP trial in meetings, and she's found, uh, she's reported a 16% decrease in preterm birth, but that's birth before 37 weeks. Um, and uh, one thing that she's also reported, because they had twins in that study, and as you know, twins may have a different mechanism for why they come a little early. So uh, I understand from her, but, but and I, I report that here, that there is a significant reduction in early preterm birth if they take out the twins in the two groups. But I think we need to wait for more data coming out from that group. And as I said before, it doesn't refute the Cochrane Review finding that DHA can reduce early preterm birth. Um, it's a nutrient, and prenatal supplements containing DHA are now widely used in both the U.S. and Australia, such that women may be entering pregnancy with improved DHA status. And I think that's also changing a little bit how we're going to be looking at this story. It, it's probably a good news story that DHA status is improving, but the sad news story is it's not improving with seafood intake. And that's my conclusion. Thanks. <laughs> and I, I don't know if there's time for a couple questions or not. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has any questions. Yes, Bill. Therefore, it's not an essential nutrient. How does choline get around that? Because it's also biosynthesized, and but isn't there a requirement for that? There is an AI for choline. Uh, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the AMA have, has again mentioned advocacy, advocacy around choline. As many of you in the room probably know, choline intake by U.S. women is considerably less than the AI for pregnancy and for lactation. I think it's around 300 and 320 milligrams on average, and the AI is 450 for pregnancy and 550 for lactation. Uh, the prenatals, very few prenatals have choline. Uh, almost no prenatals have iodine. I mean, the, these, the, the nutrients that are really of concern right now in pregnancy, DHA, vitamin D, choline and iodine, and those are nutrients that many women are not getting enough of. I think the DHA story may be changing. Of course, they're not getting 500 milligrams if that's what we're going to need to prevent early preterm birth, but that's, that's again, coming back to the message. Seafood, seafood. <laughs> Eat your seafood. <laughs> Yeah, hi, just a, a question, because I know that, um, like I've taken omega-3 supplements, and I find that when I try to step it up, I have a problem in terms of tolerating. Uh, it, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of tolerance, how does the body tolerate it? If you get all the way up to 1,000 a, a a milligram on the DHA, as you're talking about in your, in your study. Well, we, by the way, our capsules are being donated by DSM, but they're not supporting the study. It's an NICHD trial. Uh, they, we have not had complaints about that. We have complaints of women say, I can't swallow capsules because we give them three a day, and they, they say, I just, I just can't swallow three capsules. But because they're orange-flavored, I don't know, they, they don't report burping or tasting of fish or anything that, that bothers them. Yeah. We've yeah. had a few women, I think, that had nausea of pregnancy who, who attributed it to the capsules, and then they, they stopped, and then the, their nausea continued, and then they went back on them. So. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could just review the dosage of DHA that the studies were. It looked like it was 200 milligrams per, per capsule. Were there any that were taking more than that? Got the 600 a day. Yes, we, we kept track of what they told us they were taking. One of the things that was interesting in that trial that began in 2006 is at the beginning almost no one was taking DHA. Toward the end, uh, I think 13% overall of women in that study took an extra 200 milligrams on their own, and we did keep track of that. Uh, that was not really included in the analysis where I showed the reduction in early preterm birth, though. So. Hi, uh, Dave Love from Johns Hopkins. You mentioned that um, l most people in the U.S. get DHA through eggs, um, and you had a slide with the amount in eggs. And yeah. I I'm starting to see um, eggs on the market with, you know, advertised as having DHA or having omega-3s in them. 
what's the level of DHA in those eggs compared to just typically off the shelf grocery store eggs? You know, that, that, those data that I took from an official site, and they say 19 milligrams per egg, we did, a, we did a trial between 1998 and 2001 in pregnant women where we gave them ordinary eggs, we call them, and high DHA eggs. The ordinary eggs had 50 milligrams of DHA. I think that's probably closer to what you get when you eat an egg. It's probably closer to 50, but the, the high DHA eggs, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is you can't get them much above 100, about 150 milligrams per egg. But still, a woman who ate two high DHA eggs could get 300 milligrams per day, and they would be getting a really good source of choline. I think this is one of the conversations that's going on right now. Uh, I'm supposed to give a lecture on choline and DHA at uh, a meeting before FENCI, and, and I think this is where people are thinking. There's actually even some evidence from uh, Carol Cheatham that the choline and DHA levels in mother's milk are interacting to, to improve cognitive function. So again, uh, we, when we study single nutrients, uh, we've kind of put ourselves in a box, and you can find certain outcomes that may be affected, but then they might be better. And certainly in our analysis, if we could include those other nutrients as part of the uh, statistical analysis, it would be nice. We, we le we're learning <laughs> as we go along. Just one comment on that. I think commercially available, 57 milligrams or 59 milligrams of DHA is what's available in eggs, although in studies with um, the super chicken studies that I know Captain Hiblin has been involved with, they've gone upwards of about 100 milligrams, but those aren't commercially available. But I think what you bring up in terms of the synergy between these nutrients as they're naturally found in food, like with DHA and choline and an egg, for example, is really when it's bound like that, the absorption, the natural absorption that the body is, is able to do and the way it's utilized physiologically in the body I think is important. So trying to encourage people to eat eggs, whether they have extra DHA or not, um, just that little bit of DHA that's in there with the choline is probably a better source of DHA than, than many other sources. So yes, we need to do both. I, I, that's a really food. good point. And, and you know, I, I've been reflecting on this as I put this other lecture together because when we did the egg trial, we found some rather remarkable outcome. It was, the, it was a 75% African-American population. The, the women who were assigned to the high DHA eggs had six days longer pregnancy. Their babies were a normal, you know, their mean weight was a, a normal weight. As again, many of you know, African American women tend to have smaller babies. Uh, and it, as I was reflecting on this, maybe it's not just the DHA that was in those eggs, because it was only a hundred milligram difference. But both groups got the choline from egg yolk, and maybe the synergism of DHA and choline. Who knows? I mean, again, using a real food to supplement women. Uh, can produce some interesting findings, I think. Right. Well, thank you very oh. thank you very much. Thank you.